Okay, we will uh, move, move right along to our ne uh, next speaker, uh, Alexander Bardell, who is the chair of the BCS Green Specialist Group. Uh, he is also the founder of SDA Advocate, an independent sustainable technology consultancy. His passion for sustainability started in 2006 when he joined the IBM House of Carbon Initiative, which defined a simple methodology to map and address carbon usage across an organization. And this morning, Alex is going to discuss sustainable enterprise architecture, and he'll take us through what is happening and how it affects your organization. So warm welcome to the open group, please, for Alexander Bardell. Welcome, Alex. Hi there. Uh, I think you're on. Yes. Am I on? Can uh, anyone hear me? The clicker. The clicker is gone. Has Where's the clicker? the clicker? Do you have the clicker, Ron? Or, oh, it's oh, there it is. Wonderful. On the table. Accusing you of a crime you didn't commit. I apologize. Super, thank you very much. That's, that's uh, back at what? Green nice forward and back, yes, red back. So thank you very much. I've been here for, for one hour and I've learned something new. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, we represent a charity, the British Computer Society is a charity. It represents um, the IT industry and its members. So we don't have a big marketing department and my marketing department is my 13-year-old son who is learning lots and lots and is probably more proficient than I am. Um, so when we get back today, I'll be sitting down with my marketing department after his football training and seeing whether we can use a bit of um, AI to actually improve how we can do some of our presentations and slide decks. So um, what I'd like to come and talk a little bit today now, and it, it kind of works quite well from the previous presentations, a bit more detail and granularity around some of the levers and triggers which are there today, um, which we need to use and need to understand, which are kind of driving sustainability. And, Part of this is if we go, when I started off, um, and my role then was as an enterprise architect, the conversations I was having with firms was predominantly with the marketing department, and it's all about the brand and the brand image and how we can make marketing sustainable. And this was because we didn't have many other triggers, and the reality was it was a bit challenging because the companies would all say, yes, we absolutely want to be sustainable. We want net zero, but there's no real legislation, there's no drivers, no kind of business case justification. And back in those days, it was really hard to actually get your foot in the door. But now it's great that I'm here today and, and that sustainability has become more relevant and more prevalent. Um, that's a positive on a negative. The reason why is not necessarily so good, so it's climate change and combating climate change. Um, but today, I'd just like to go through some of the key elements which, as an enterprise architect, you probably would like to consider when thinking about your um, architectural framework, your guiding principles, building out your enterprise architecture. So climate change has become an issue. Um, and if anyone was part of COP27 last year, it was quite prevalent that we're having some of the issues like the flooding in Pakistan, um, the adverse weather conditions in America. And we're looking more than just net zero. We've got to think a bit about mitigation, about how some of these more um, at-risk areas can adapt, and possibly how the richer world is able to compensate um, some of the, the poor areas which are most at risk. And so, really, it, it's, it's kind of driving this message home. And, and because of it, it's becoming more important. So employees, particularly employees who are coming out of university now, want to work for companies who have real, genuine sustainability credentials, not companies which maybe just greenwash or pretend to be sustainable. So. This is driving employees, um, and maybe some of the employees that you want to actually come into your companies to say, look, we are genuinely sustainable, and this is what we are actually doing. Um, investors are under pressure now. Um, so institutional investment, pension funds, to actually ensure that they're making investment decisions with companies who are um, environmental and have uh, the right credentials. So I'm gonna talk a little bit around the, the ESGs, the environmental, social, and governance framework which is growing, it's becoming maybe legally binding in some places, but it's definitely um, an important aspect for uh, investors to make investment decisions. Um, and consumers are driving change. The consumers are getting worried about climate change and they want to make sure that the companies that they're buying products and services for are sustainable. Um, and so this will be driving some of the governance and so at the top of the companies, um, the CIOs are beginning to understand that this is maybe a, an important thing to think about, and then this should then start filtering down the organization, and therefore the IT, the technology, and the enterprise architectural um, 
element within the organization need to consider sustainability as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the um, uh, SDGs. I've made a mistake. Um, S the, the SDGs there in a slightly different aspect, but um, yeah, I've written 18 instead of 17. Um, but you know, this is important because the UN are using this to kind of push their view of how we should look after the planet. My children are learning about the SDGs in school today, so this is now something that, that, that the, the kids of, and people at university are literate with. They understand what they are. They understand the aspects about it. And so we now need to think about how we place technology within this new arena that, that, that we're beginning to see and these new information sources that are coming along. Um, so it's interesting. So if we're listening to the cops, um, there's really two aspects to technology. There's technology itself and getting its own house in order. So we need to think about our carbon emissions. We need to think about our resource usages. But there's also the other part, which I'll probably not have time to talk about today, which is how is technology going to be an enabler to support us on this journey? And COP26 in Glasgow was an example of the, of the what. What is it we need to do? What are we going to have to change? Um, and COP27 was the how. What are the things that we need to put into place? And interestingly, I had an invite to COP26, but because it was in Glasgow and there were so many people there, I couldn't go. COP27 was the first COP where anyone can join anywhere in the world online. And this is how technology has really helped us to do that. But one of the key messages that came out of COP27 is that technology is the glue. It's the binder. There's all of these gaps that exist in terms of how we mitigate and deliver against climate change, how we deliver all of these projects. Um, and then there is a gap which they can't fill. And they say, well, OK, you know, technology needs to fulfill this role. So if you're sitting in, a, in an organization and you're thinking about what is it we want to do, where do we want to go, certainly it, it's worth listening to the cops and trying to understand how can we use the skills and sets we have in our toolbox, our technologies, how can we place these into these gaps to actually help us get to net zero and achieve our 2050 goal? Um, and so if you want to look at the, the areas which where technology is a direct effect, um, obviously climate action. So currently it's believed to be around about between 2 and 10% of all global emissions are coming directly from IT. Um, the area which is really doing very well is communities and cities. Um, so smart cities, if you look at London, look how London's changed in the last 10, 15 years, how much technology has become a key part of how we live our lives in London and how these technologies are trying to make life more sustainable. Um, so in these, these areas, the 11, 12, 13, 7, 8, and 9 is where we believe there's a direct influence in terms of technology. But as you have already said, things like big data analytics, um, technology actually is affects all 17 of the, um, the SDGs. And so it's a you know, a wide encompassing role, but then the direct effect probably sits within these ones. So there's an interesting lot of conversation discussion, particularly now within IT, and this is around scope reporting. Um, so up to now, it's been relatively straightforward. We've had this concept of scope one. And it's, so what scope reporting is, um, part of the greenhouse gas protocol, corporate value chain, um, was that it wanted firms and organizations to be able to report their carbon usage. Uh, and one of the real reasons why this is very important is that we need to get to that baseline and the baseline of where we are today. And so if you think about your standard um, enterprise architect technology project, you have your, this is what we want to do, our 2B state. We have our as is state, and then we can do our road mapping to get us to where we want to get to. But if your as is state isn't understood, well, then it's going to be quite difficult to get to your 2B state and do your road mapping. So, one of the, the, the sort of drivers for the scope reporting was to try and get organizations at that point in time where they understood what their missions were and where they were coming from. So we started off with scope one, and that's quite simple. It's the direct uh, usage you have, so the fuel used, company vehicles, the really direct emissions. And then the scope two indirect, again, was relatively straightforward, so you could understand your purchase electricity, heating, steam like that. So these are things to measure. But now we're moving to the stage where we, we need to focus on our scope three emissions. And scope three is a bit more complicated because that includes the supply chain, so everything that you're consuming, um, the waste disposal, so removing and, and disposing of your ICT assets, um, but also 
where it starts getting a little more challenging is, well, hold on, our, our um, IT strategy has been cloud only. So now we need to understand what proportion of our emissions are being consumed from our cloud service provider. Um, so our cloud service provider then needs to give us our emissions data, which we could then use to include in our own reporting. Now, a few years ago, this was impossible. They wouldn't provide that data. But I think that, that the, cloud, the big cloud service providers, so people like Amazon and Google, have sort of understood that this is a, this is a need, and they're beginning to provide that data and that information but it does mean that the, the process is, is, is a lot more complicated. And I guess the reason why is if you look at this other chart here, we can see where we are today in terms of the emissions that we're getting from um, carbon-based fuels. And as we see, so transportation, um, buildings, these probably make up about half of all of our emissions. They're going to have to transition to zero carbon, which means we're going to need to be using... Um, renewable energy sources. So not only are we going to have to um, transition from carbon to non-carbon carbon energy sources, which predominantly here means electric, um, we're going to have to then seriously increase the amount of energy that we're um, receiving from these sources. So it means that unless we include energy efficiency, and again, the less with less, the more with less, it's going to be very difficult for us to then transition everything to renewable energy sources. Um, while still being able to provide the energy we need. So one of the really important things about scope three reporting is to understand where you are today, and then we want to start moving to that point where we have an idea of how we get to net zero. And net zero is, part of it is renewables, definitely. Part of it is um, zero carbon energy, but another big proportion is to be, we're gonna have to be a lot more efficient in terms of the energy we do use because there's just not gonna be as much energy to go around. Maybe, I mean, maybe this might change. We might be able to, reach that point, but where we stand today, I think that's probably one of the big challenges. Um, so we've got the rise of the, the ESG um, reporting, and this is quite interesting. So last month I attended a, a legal, IT legal event where the legal frameworks and the legal practices associated with um, ESG reporting are becoming much more prevalent. So. I don't know whether the people here, is this a common thing? Are we people beginning to hear and see and speak about ESGs as part of the company view? Yes, yep, so we're getting more. So interesting to see that as time goes by, it's definitely, you know, when I had this conversation a year ago, there was no response at all. As time goes on, they're becoming more prevalent. And interestingly, there's some, some um, stats. So as we can see, there are $2.7 trillion um, as of December 2021. 81% in Europe, and in some European countries, there's an actual movement to say that actually it's going to be legally binding to be to provide your ESG reporting. Um, so it, it's fundamentally there, and and it's making a change. But right now it's a little bit pragmatic. So if you look at a company like Tesla, Tesla, you should think, great, you know, they make electric cars, absolutely brilliant, should have the best ESG reporting stats, but they don't because it's environment, social, and governance, and therefore they may do very well in environment, but social, there's been some questions around how Tesla employees are treated, governance, Elon and his tweeting and affecting the markets, and so it's maybe a, a challenge as whether you're looking at it in terms of an environmental sustainability perspective or whether you're looking at it in terms of social and governance structure as well. So yes, it's a good point, but it maybe needs a little more focus in terms of trying to get it to balance out a bit. And, and um, if you want to find out a bit more about ESG reporting, I suggest you don't go and look on YouTube um, or social media because I wasn't aware of this, but it's quite a contentious issue. So you're going to get lots of very sort of right-wing people talking about woke and neoconservatism. And, and there seems to be uh, a lot of contention that I wasn't aware of where people really don't like this because they feel that it's trying to sort of influence the thing adversely. But... You know, there's a lot of good information, so it'd be useful to understand what it is and, and why it actually means, uh, why it's important, and why it's actually making a difference. And um, it's predicted that in, in the next five or ten years, that number of 2.7 will go to 30 trillion. So that then becomes a significant proportion of global economy is under the, under the um, framework of, of ESG reporting. Now... The reason why I do sustainability marketing 
is because when I first started off, the part of the company was the, who was really focused on sustainability and technology was this concept of the, the corporate social responsibility, the sort of Ben and Jerry's of this world where their brand and their product is about being sustainable. And therefore, it's a product and a marketing question rather than a business and a, a technology problem. So when I first started and I came knocking on the door, my predominantly, the people I was working with were the marketing and the brand people were within a firm. So one of the really important things to do is if, if a company is sustainable and if a company does do some really good things, um, is to be able to talk about it, to actually say, look, you know, we're doing these great things and this is why we're doing them. Um, and then when the business case side of things come along, if there's a brand benefit from being sustainable and you've done all these great projects to become a, um, a better company and reduce your emissions, then it's really beneficial to actually be able to use that tools and use the things to do to actually promote it. So a lot of the work that I've been doing um, has been working with companies to actually say, right, we've done these projects, we're doing our reporting, we're reducing our emissions, and this is how we're going to market it. And the other thing I've been doing is saying, well, actually, that's not necessarily sustainable. And where if you start marketing this as being a, um, a sustainable thing, you're going to be accused of greenwashing. And greenwashing is a big problem where um, companies maybe think they're doing the right thing and are motivated and they then start marketing themselves um, as being this very sustainable company. And then when people start poking and prodding around and looking at it, they realize well, actually, that's not necessarily true, and it can cause um, quite a lot of brand damage to your company if you haven't thought through exactly what it is that um, sustainability is and that you are genuinely doing the right thing. So, interesting, in the UK last year, the um, HM government reduced this thing called the Digital Data and Technology Playbook, and within there, there is a um, sustainability element. So, if you're a company or an organization who wants to do business with the government, um, you will be expected to provide some sustainability credentials. And it's unfortunate the, the speaker was supposed to come today, Adam Turner from DEFRA, um, actually has a whole presentation about government policy in terms of procurement of, of um, services. But it's quite useful because if you use the same principles here for your own organization, um, it, will mean, it will allow you to better understand sustainability in terms of what, what it is you want to do. So you know, one of the key things that they're asking for is this PPN um, 0621, which is a carbon reduction plan, which says if you're going to do business with the government, um, you need to show that you have a carbon reduction plan in place and that you can actually go some way to achieving your sort of net zero policies in 2050. So you know, as an organization, if you say, right, well, when I'm dealing with a cloud provider or a third party, if I can start asking them to provide me um, some of these um, stats, some of these metrics, some of these data, so I can better understand their supply chain, that I know that they have a plan to get to net zero and it's genuine, um, and that maybe even I sign a code of conduct with them to ensure that they meet some of these expectations, then some of the, the, the work that, that UK Gov is doing is actually probably useful as a basis for you in terms of your own procurement um, plan uh, in terms of how you can ensure that you can procure um, sustainable uh, third-party suppliers. And I guess, again, this is really relevant when if you look at how IT is consumed today. You know, previously, you had your own data center, you had your own computers, but now your colos, um, there's third-party data centers, there's cloud, there's as a service. So more and more, um, the way we consume IT is through third parties, and therefore, it's really important to get it right at the procurement contractual phase because um, it's there when you can understand whether your supplier is going to be sustainable or not sustainable. And that's then important when you have to do your scope three reporting because obviously if your supplier can't provide the data or they're not sustainable, then that's going to have an adverse effect on your sort of carbon usage reporting that you're going to have to provide um, as part of your journey to net zero 2050 um, deliverables. So, one of the ways to try and avoid greenwashing, and there are lots of different allegedly sustainable standards out there, is to see whether your third parties actually have some valid um, certifications which you can use. So one of the ones here, EU Code of Conduct for Data Centers. So are the data centers energy efficient? Um, are the data centers constructed using materials which are low in carbon? 
are the data centers situated in a country where the energy mix is from um, renewables and zero carbon. So a good example is somebody was building a data center in Poland, but Poland predominantly is getting its energy from burning ligite, which is brown coal. So therefore, the carbon footprint of the energy source in Poland is really bad. And as a consequence, that then means that when you're actually looking at your end-to-end -end emissions, you have to include a proportion of your energy coming from brown coal, which is not a very good source. Whereas alternatively, if you were to do something in Norway, most of Norway's energy source is, is from renewables, and therefore um, the actual total carbon footprint associated with the data center and the IT equipment in there is better because it's coming from um, renewable sources rather than coal-based sources. Again, BREEAM is another good certification which looks at the manufacturing process of the building to understand if the build environment is sustainable. Um, we've got some of our US standards. So if you're on a global project, you want to be looking at what's happening in the US. Um, obviously, Uptime Institute um, to look at energy efficiency of the data centers. Um, CEDA, which is our very own um, BCS derived uh, standards where we look at energy efficiency of data centers and, uh, and award a data center based on their energy efficiency standards. Um, and obviously ISO with their 14,000 standards and similarly recently the, the, the BSI, uh, British Standards Institute have brought out a whole set of standards associated with, with um, sustainability. So you know, one of your questions when you're asking your suppliers about their sustainability standards is try and understand if they have achieved a certain level of um, sustainability based on the certifications that they've managed to um, achieve against. So I talked a lot about data systems and computing, but um, one of the interesting areas, and areas that people don't really discuss very much is sustainability and software. So it's not the data center that's using the energy, it's not even the compute that's using the energy. It's the software that sits on top of it. And up till now, there's been very little focus on how you can actually make your software more sustainable. So, you know, it should be seen as part of a, a project to try and consolidate software products. Um, unfortunately, the way that uh, computers have grown over time, it's, it's not linear, it doesn't stay like that. Moore's law means that the compute processing power has been going up, the relative cost has been going down, um, and it's really only been going on one trajectory. And because of that, there's been no real incentive to say, how can we actually write software which is more energy efficient? Um, so there's some guiding principles in terms of how you want to think about generating green software. And obviously, it all starts with the code. Um, and certainly, certainly the, the carbon measurements are looking in the wrong place. We're looking at the data center, but it's not the data center that's driving it. It's the software. It's the software that, that, that powers the computers that then consume the energy. Um, and if you're thinking of a cloud-only architecture, well, then that actually gets even more complicated because you maybe you've got a, a data source here. You've maybe got a compute source here. You've probably got um, some APIs and some extra elements connected. So then you've suddenly got quite a, a kind of distributed um, software state using multiple vendors to provide a common set of services. Um, so cloud is... is definitely a, a source for good because it's a more efficient way of delivering um, compute, but it's more challenging to try and understand where the carbon is. Um, so there are some things out there to help you. So obviously Microsoft has its principal green, um, but I would you know, look a bit careful because you know, Microsoft products tend to have a lot of bulk in there. They're not necessarily the most energy efficient. They have extra software modules you don't necessarily need. Um, another place to look is the, the Green Software Foundation. Um, but as we already discussed, there's some big challenges coming along. So AI is definitely a, um, a product for, or a thing for good. So we could use AI in, in a good way. But I find this, um, this, this stat from MIT, which is that to train an AI module, um, uses as many carbon emissions it takes to build, drive, and dispose of five cars over their lifetime. So that's actually quite a lot of carbon. So we've got to really think about AI in terms of its cost and its benefit. There are benefits, but there are costs. And I don't think right now people are looking at the cost associated with AI. They're all interested in the wonderful features and functions that it has. And we've got to be careful because 
we've kind of going this path. So when we got cloud, suddenly the cost of IT dropped significantly. And what happened is lots more people were able to use compute. And so cloud improved the access to compute, but it also increased the emissions. We then had big data analytics, which is a similar kind of thing, where you're then looking at huge unstructured data sources. And there's, you know, there's benefits if you want to map um, deforestation in the Amazon. Big data is perfect. You couldn't do it any other way. So there's a benefit, but again, you're interrogating more data, and more data means more carbon usage. Um, and then the, the final bit was that the, um, um, you know, the, the point is that we need to get a balance. And we can't just keep going on the trajectory we're going now, because whereas other industries are reducing their um, energy usage, um, they were looking at how they get to net zero right now, technology is, is still going up. We're not reducing. We keep coming up with new ways to use compute and, and do these, these extra things for us. We, you know, we're moving to a, a digital by default world, but that runs the risk of cooking the, the planet to a certain degree as well. So we have to try and get that balance right in terms of um, green software, um, energy efficiency, uh, and compute. Um, it's quite interesting. Uh, these guys here, the, the Rosetta code, did a ranking of all the programming languages um, to try and understand which ones were the more efficient. And unsurprisingly, the older ones, the Cs, the Pascals, um, the C++'s, these languages which were written from a time when there wasn't much compute, uh, are very efficient in terms of the amount of energy they use relative to the amount of compute they do. And then as we get to the more digital ones at the bottom, the Pythons, the Javas, um, the Rubies, these, um, Software languages are pretty good for doing simple little digital things, but you really need to think about if you're going to write your whole application, it's not going to be probably the most efficient way of doing it. So some of the key things is to think about your data. I mean, we've got one way we're saying data is great, but obviously when you're inter interrogating data, you're using compute power. So how can you minimize the amount of data you need to interrogate? Um, select a programming language that is sustainable. Try and remove some of those unused features, the libraries, the software loops, all the things you don't need that come all bundled up within your software package aren't necessarily what you need. Um, monitor and manage your energy use. So think about your energy. Think about getting some monitoring and some analytics on your software when you're coding it so that it actually you can have a look at it and say, we are improving it. We're making it more energy efficient. We can actually see that in our data center or our usage. We're using less cloud instances, and therefore we must be doing some improvement. Um, and as the, you know, as the, the um, audience here is predominantly enterprise architects, this question probably needs to be asked as our suppliers, the people who are delivering our software, can they do something similar? Um, and so what are we looking for from our suppliers? So um, if I check, how am I doing for time? I can't see the clock. Uh, almost up. Almost up, right, so I'll zoom on quickly. So. Um, we talked a bit about e-waste. So e-waste is a big problem, 50 million, 54 million. Um, and one of the challenges is that we, we're not using our assets properly. And we're sending a lot of assets straight to recycling rather than reuse. So in Europe, there's a big second use market. So you know, part of the strategy is, first thing, can we repurpose something? So we don't need to necessarily get rid of our own assets. Can we just reuse our assets in a slightly different way when they come to the end of their effective first life so they effectively have a second life? Um, and if we can, then great. Um, if we can't, then let's sell them on to someone else. Um, but if we really have reached the end of the life, where we have to be very careful is how do we actually recycle those assets? Um, and if you look at e-waste, um, it's got some good stuff in there. So there is ceramics, metal, silicon, plastics. And currently, the, the, um, the best place to mine gold is a big pile of e-waste. It has the highest concentration of gold. It has um, what the, the, the rare earth metals, which aren't particularly rare, but are quite hard to mine and come from um, single, single locations, which is geographically and, and politically quite challenging. So can we not think a little bit about how can we actually use e-waste in a way that we take these assets out? And this is going to get really important because we're going to renewables, so obviously wind turbines um, have huge magnets, use expensive, difficult to find rare earth metals. Um, 
And but within the UK, there are a number of people who are actually focusing on this. So there is Birmingham University is looking at recycling magnets. In Cambridge, they have a project where bacteria are um, eating e-waste and taking out the, um, the rare earth metals. And similarly, um, Coventry University are focusing on a project to recycle uh, the magnets in, and some of the rare earth metals in there. But what we have to get away from is the challenge which has happened in the past, which if we go back to this one, um, only 12.5% of e-waste is recycled. The rest of it is just disappearing out of the supply chain. It's ending up in countries who are not um, really prepared to recycle it. And if you search on the internet for some of the, the things that are happening in Africa or Indonesia, it's pretty unpleasant. There's big piles of burning e-waste, and it's not really what we should do. So we need to try and focus our efforts on how we can actually close that loop. Um, and that means researching um, and developing ways of recycling some of these quite challenging materials. But the really message here is it needs to remain in the UK. And it needs to remain in, in the country that has the products because we're the people who have the ability to actually develop the ways of recycling these materials. And they're very valuable. They're quite scarce. And if we go to a, a zero carbon world where we all drive electric vehicles and we need renewable sources, we actually need to get all of this back again. So the hard drives and compute we need those magnets, we need these materials, and we can't just keep throwing them away because we just don't have the, the materials available. Um, I'll skip that one, skip that one, and skip that one. So just a summary now. So hopefully that's given you a little idea of some of the triggers and the levers which are there, which are gonna be happening and are happening at the higher ends of the, um, at the C-suite within the organizations. And so as we start moving down, um, people within enterprise architecture are going to be asked to start providing some of these data. They need to provide um, information for the SDGs, um, the ESGs, so the UN want to integrate e the ESGs with the SDGs, so they become one thing. Um, we're going to be needed to do deliver scope one, two, and three reporting, so that's going to be a given, and it probably is legally required in some places. It will become legally required, I think, here in, a, in some period of time. Um, but as you're making your decisions, there are a number of standards that you can deliver. So we have standards out there, the C to the ISO, the BSI standards, which you can ask of your suppliers and be careful of people with dubious standards which don't mean anything. And there's lots of those out there, so the, the, the risk of greenwashing. Um, the government Digital data playbook is a good start point. Um, and we've got the Carbon Trust. So Carbon Trust provides lots of useful data that you can go and look at, which help you along your path in terms of carbon reporting. They have thought leadership pieces, and most of the things they have they provide are without cost. So it's a, something you can use to make a start. So there we go. That's my presentation finished. <laughs> Hopefully it's been useful. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, please take a, take a seat. I'm going to combine a couple of the questions yep. um, in the interest of time. But um, great, great presentation, sense of some real tips and things mm -hmm. to think about and takeaways. So thank you for yep. that. Um, so uh, I'll combine these two. Um, first part, what is your opinion on how companies' ESG data will be independently governed and audited in the future, um, combined with... When can we expect the, the current scope yep. one to three are kind of passive metrics. When can we ex, um, expect active prescription and governance to match these goals? So based on the, 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 the legal conferences that I've attended over the last 12 months or so, there is a kind of movement to create a legal framework and it will have an auditable framework similar to say an audit firm mm -hmm. coming to audit your accounts um, it needs to be independent, it needs to meet a certain set of standards, um, and we're beginning to see that within Europe, and it'll be interesting to see where the UK goes, it's, everything's a bit, you know, because of the way we are right now, it's quite hard to see which direction we're going in, but I suspect that we'll probably go in a similar way, where, you know, in the way that you are audited for your accounts, you're going to be audited for your ESG rating, and therefore your rating is then delivered by an independent third party, um, and by doing that, it then has the... Um, I guess the, the kind of structure and, and the governance and, and the ability for other people to then read that as they would read any um, auditing that's done of a firm, so third party. Do you see that being like 
European and maybe US or whatever, or do you think there's any chance of a global approach? I would like to see a global approach because as you know, if, if you spend any time looking at listening to the UN, listening to the COPs, it's about the fact that this is not a country or a region specific problem we need to solve, it's a global problem. And therefore, we would really like to see global standards that are there that everyone can adhere to. And, and I think this is really prevalent again in the technology industry because we have projects which go across regions and it, it would simplify the process a lot if we could have one set of global standards that everyone could adhere to. But that might just be wishful thinking on my behalf. Well, it's a nice, nice goal though, it will be far more useful. Um, what evidence, evidence do you think there is of shareholder demand for green outcomes, that, that that's actually a concern that's overriding corporate investment decisions of over putting that over financial expectations? Um, well, I guess it's a balancing act, isn't it? So, I mean, it's always, this has always been a risk, and particularly when there were no things like the ESG, is that when you talked to business leaders, they would always say, look, we absolutely believe in this. But what we can't do is put our company out of business because um, you know, we're meeting these ESG standards. Now, if everyone has to do it, well, then that means that it's, um, you know, it's something that, that, that is like a business cost that's associated with all businesses. Uh, but I guess from, from that perspective, this is, again, why it has to be a global thing. It's no, you know, if, if, if Europe is doing something and Asia isn't, well, then it's going to put them at a comparative disadvantage. And because of that, that's then going to affect the business leaders in Europe are going to say, hold on, I'm not doing this. Um, so this is why it needs to be a, a, a globally recognized um, thing. But yeah, I, you know, I guess the other driver though is consumers. Yeah. So consumers are the people who are driving this. Um, and I never believed there would be much consumer driven, but there seems to be particularly um, within younger people who are a better understanding of the ESGs now. Um, have a better understanding of the sustainable development goals from the UN because you know our kids are learning it in school, right. and you know so they this is part of their curriculum. Their view of the world is slightly different, so there is, is an expectation that when they come um, out of school, out of university, get jobs consumed, that the products and services they're consuming will be more sustainable, and we're already seeing that with the the twenty somethings who are coming into the, the workforce right now. Okay. Um, again, consolidating a couple of questions. Um, data, the data source power topic, if yep. that's incriminating, why would anyone support a supply chain originating somewhere where coal powers the grid? The um, example was given of Arizona, for example. Well, the, the idea is, so to the, just understand the question, so why? Yeah, so why would, you, why would anyone support um, if, it, if it's such a clear-cut thing that yep. where, your, where your power is generated, yep. I, mean, I think you gave the example of Poland is, yep. is a bad source. If that's incriminating, why would people support that? Um, w uh, why would the country support it? Well, why, I think why would, why would customers support that? Um, is, I'm, I'm interpreting the question now, but uh, yep. why would anyone support a supply chain originating in, say, Arizona, USA, where coal powers the grid? Well, I suspect is that, that the point is that they won't. And then the objective is, is that um, Arizona would then think about transitioning away from coal-powered power stations to renewables. But I, I think the, the thing is that that's, it's not in the mix now. So you say, you're not, you say, okay, I've got an energy source. I've got a, a data center of the PUE of one. And theoretically, you know, I've got this super energy efficient data center. But in my calculation mix, I haven't calculated the mix of where the energy source is coming from. So when I include the energy source mix into the overall calculation of the sustainability of my data center, then I understand, well, actually, it's not that sustainable. And right. if these countries, Arizona and Poland, want to be in the data center business, then they need to start transitioning right. their energy away from coal it's a little bit quicker. It's going to affect those decisions. Yep. Yeah. 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 Alex, we'll leave it there and uh, let people get to their, to their break. But, uh, okay. Hopefully you'll be around if people yes, want to Yes, I'll be around you. here for the day and then I'll head off. Ask questions. questions, great. Thank you very much, Alex Bardell. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.